Here's some help with the experiment 9 pre-lab. The first question says, some burettes are calibrated in units of 0.01 milliliters. How precisely should you estimate the volume readings when using one of these burettes? So most burettes are actually calibrated in units of 0.1 milliliters. That's what it says for this problem in your book. I changed that to the hundredth place just so that you could get an idea for the concept you need to understand for this problem and apply it to the problem that's actually in your book yourself. So here they're giving us 0.01. Now that hundredths place is where your certainty ends. So when people were putting lines on the glassware, they were careful only to the hundredths place. After that, they stopped paying attention to the accuracy of the lines. And so, what if you have a measurement that's in between the lines? Well, then you have to estimate. And so, by convention, whenever you read the, a number of significant figures off of, the off of a piece of glassware, you always look for the place, the decimal place, to which they added the lines. And then you read the number to the next place, the place where you have to estimate. So if, they, if, you're, if a piece of glassware is calibrated to the hundredths place, you would write the answer to the thousandths place. So with a burette calibrated in units of 0 0.01, you should estimate the volume readings to the thousandths place. If the burette were calibrated to the thousandths place, then you would write the number to the ten thousandths place. You always just put one more decimal place to the right than what it's calibrated to. Question two says, briefly compare and contrast the analyte and the titrant. To which solution is the indicator most often added? So the first part of this is briefly comparing and contrasting the analyte and the titrant. So these are two characters in a titration. So a procedure called a titration. A titration is a way of figuring out the acidity of an unknown solution. So let's say you had lake water and a bunch of fish are dying in the lake, you think that it might be the acidity of the lake, and you need to put some calcium carbonate in there to make the water less acidic. So first you have to figure out what the pH of the water is, and you would do a titration for that. Likewise, if you wanted to find, the, find out how acidic someone's blood is, uh, you think that might be contributing to a disease of theirs, you would also do a titration to figure out the acidity of that. So a titration is a procedure you use to figure out the acidity of some unknown solution. So let's, uh, in order to understand what a titration is, let's think about it in terms of a balance to see how this works. So let's say you had an unknown weight on one side of a balance. How could you figure out what that weight is? Well, you can add known weights to the other side, and when they finally balance, well, now you know what your unknown is, or your unknown is whatever you added. Okay, so a titration is the same idea but the unknown that you start with isn't a weight, it's the amount of H plus ions that you have. If you remember, H plus is an acid. So that's telling you how acidic something is. And what you're going to do to balance that out is not another weight, but rather OH minus ions. And when the solution is finally neutral, you'll know how many OH ions OH minus ions you added, and therefore you'll know how many H plus ions there had to be in solution. So that's the, the thought process behind a titration. Now, in the titration, the unknown that you're analyzing, that's called the analyte. And the known amount of OH minus that you're adding is called the titrant. So that's the first characteristic between these two. The analyte has an unknown concentration, that's what we're trying to find out, and the titrant has a known concentration, that's what we're going to use to find out the concentration of the analyte. Another difference is that the analyte usually goes in an Erlenmeyer flask, and if you uh, remember, this is what an Erlenmeyer flask looks like. It sort of tapers at the top, unlike a beaker, which just goes straight up. This tapers at the top to make it easier to stir the solution, swirl it with your wrist, without it splashing all over the place. And the titrant goes into a piece of glassware called a burette. So that's this. It's a very long, thin piece of glassware with a lot of lines on it. Uh, the knob at the bottom either lets you open or close 
a hole that would allow water to go through into the air laminar flask that you're titrating it into. So you would keep this up with something called a burette clamp. Notice how it's going in between those two knobs. We'll use one of those in lab. Here it is standing up. Um, and so here you can see the titrant in the burette, in the analyte, in the Erlenmeyer flask. So that's that difference. Now the, third, the next question says, to which solution is the indicator most often added? And the indicator is a molecule that changes color at a specific pH. So if you go back to our balance analogy, where you're trying to figure out the unknown weight by adding a known weight, well, you know when the, they're equal because the balance is perfectly level. But when you're adding OH minus, which is clear, to H plus, which is also clear, how do you know when the amount is equal? Because it's just going to stay clear. So the way you're going to do that is by adding a molecule called an indicator that will change color around that point. So the indicator is therefore added to the analyte. Now there are a couple examples. The most famous example, and the one we'll use in lab, is called phenolphthalein. It turns pink in basic solution. So at the bottom they're talking about pH. pH is a scale to measure how acidic a solution is. It's a scale that goes from 0 to 14, where 7 is perfectly neutral. Anything between 0 and 7 is acidic. Anything between 7 and 14 is basic. The lower the number is, the more acidic it is. The higher the number is, the more basic it is. And so you can see that as the pH increases and gets higher, and therefore the solution gets more basic, phenolphthalein turns first a light pink and then a dark pink. So that's a, that's a relatively fancy molecule, but you can also get indicators. They're all over the place. You can get them at home. One common way to get one of them is through turmeric. You can buy turmeric at Publix or a grocery store. And uh, at a low pH, turmeric is a light yellow, as you see on the left. And at a higher pH, it turns a sort of dark brown, as you see on the right. So if you're ever curious about the pH qualitatively, the pH of any solution that you're dealing with, you can always just buy some turmeric, put it in the solution, and get an idea of whether it's acidic or basic. Okay, so that's another difference that we can use to compare the analyte and the titrant. The indicator is often added to the analyte because we want to know when the, the analyte is about neutral. The titrant wouldn't have indicator added to it usually. So to give you an idea of what this looks like in practice, here's just a quick demonstration of a titration. So you have a fellow with the analyte in the Erlenmeyer flask. Notice how when he adds just a little bit of the titrant from the burette, the solution turns pink quickly. And notice how he's stirring it the whole time so that the solution stays homogeneous. So he would, he would do that until he got just a light pink. And at that point, he would be, he'd be at the end of the titration. It'd be close to having equal amounts of H plus and OH minus. So that's a nice segue into this next question, question three. It says, briefly describe the difference in the end point and the equivalence point. So the equivalence point is when the moles of H plus equal the moles of OH minus. That's when the balance is even. Now, the problem, of course, is that that is usually clear. So it's hard to identify when that ha happens. The end point is when the indicator changes color. And that's usually just a little bit past the equivalence point. So phenolphthalein, for example, doesn't change, turn pink until the solution becomes slightly basic. But at that point, you've added just a little bit more moles of OH- than you had of H+. Remember that OH- is a base and H+, is an acid. So the equivalence point is when the moles of H+, and OH- actually equal each other. And the end point is when the indicator changes color. Ideally, those two would be as close as possible. And so just to visually represent that, the equivalence point would be that clear solution. And then the end point would be slightly pink for phenolphthalein. And you just have just a little bit more of that OH- minus to make it basic, to make the phenolphthalein turn pink, to let you know, you be able to visually see that you're at 
the end of the titration. And here you can see what a solution would look like before the endpoint, right? That might be the equivalence point when it's completely clear, but you don't know. It's hard to tell. At the endpoint, you see how light of a pink it is. The lighter the pink, the closer you are to the equivalence point. So you want to get the lightest pink possible. And then way after the endpoint, you, know, you have a very basic solution and the phenylphthalein has turned very dark pink. Question four says, explain how air bubbles in the burette tip might lead to poor results. And how should the air bubbles be removed? So uh, if you have air bubbles in the burette tip, eventually when you open the stopcock, the air bubbles will come out and you're going to think that you added titrant, whereas actually you didn't. You just added air that never went into the solution at all. So the having air bubbles is going to mess up your volume readings for, the tit for how much titrant you added. You're going to think you added more titrant than you actually did. You really added some titrant and some air. Uh, that's what you actually added, but you're going to think you added all titrant. So that's how that will mess up your results. And then how should the air bubbles be removed? That would be by gently tapping on the end of the burette, almost in the same way that you agitate a test tube with your fingers. Question five says, to the right is a drawing with two burettes. Use the drawing to answer the following questions. First, A, what is the initial burette reading of the titrant? So that's going to be the left. You can see it's labeled initial reading. And notice that you have that dip of a meniscus. That's what that bow of water is called. It's called a meniscus because water tends to stick to the glass. And so it sort of bows up toward where the glass is. And so here, you always want to read it at the bottom of the meniscus. And you can see that each of these lines represents a tenth. So you'd have 9, then 9.1, 9.2, 9.3, 9.4, The lowest line we have is 9.6, and we're just a little bit below that. Below that, you can estimate it. So 9.6 something. And here, I'm just going to estimate it as 9.63. So that would be the initial burette reading of the titrant. B asks, what is the final burette reading of the titrant? And so again, we're going to look at the bottom of the meniscus. And each of these lines is a tenth again. So we have 24, 24.1, and it's a little bit below that. So you can estimate beyond that because you don't have a line. It's not calibrated to that extent. So you have 24.1, I'm just going to say 6 milliliters. So that'll be the final burette reading. Notice that the numbers increase as you go down on a burette. That's the reverse of what normally happens where the numbers increase as you go up in a piece of glassware. So now, part C says, what volume of titrant was added? Well, we're just going to take the final reading and subtract the initial reading. So 24.16 milliliters in this case, minus 9.63. And that would give us 14.53 milliliters. And that would be the amount, the volume of titrant that was added.